as your pastor, <clears throat> it's important for me that you know what this book is, what this book does, that you understand how it works. It opens like this. <laughs> there, the Bible was not handed down from heaven like this for us today. It was, it was collected through time. The, the early writer, the first writer that we have, uh, Moses, we spent a long time as a church going through his experience with leading God's people. And as he brought God's people out of, he brought this, this people that were called to be separate to himself out of this land of paganism, this land that, that worshipped everything but God, the true God, the one God, the, they, he, he realized that they needed to understand certain things about what happened before, what, and he wanted to describe God in a very specific way. And so he, 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 he writes down these things, he tells them, he writes things down, and then people later on, they come along and they, 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 under, they read what he says and they, they understand about God for themselves and they add to it, and there goes another book, Joshua. And, and, then, and then the next people, they come along and they keep adding. They, they, they read what happened before, and then they add to it, to, and um, truth is added to truth, and thought is joined to thought, one building upon the foundation of the last, growing higher, digging deeper, running wider than ever before. And so we have this. It opens in a very intentional way. It describes that before God was hovering over the face of the deep, there was darkness. The earth was without form and void. It was dark, darkness. And there God was hovering over this earth in that darkness. And God spoke, and there was light in that darkness. There was darkness, God spoke, and there was light in that darkness. And it still happens that way, that before God speaks, there is total darkness. But when God speaks, light appears. So then the, this book, it explains that, that God then separates the light from the darkness, he separates. He does this amazing act of separation from light from dark. And these themes, they, they continue to be picked up and played with to tell this story. It's, it's telling our story, playing with light. Light, that it's our story, and it's how our story intersects with God's story. How these things intersect creates this story right here. Now, John, much later in the Bible, the fourth gospel, the, the last gospel, well, the, the fourth gospel, I shouldn't say that, uh, he, he's speaking to a very mixed audience. It's an audience, it's, a, it's people that know the story of the beginning, of how God spoke and there was light, and he's also just speaking to a group of people that he knows probably has no exposure to this story at all. So knowing these things that John, the disciple and friend of Jesus, he opens this, his account that might be new to some people and it might be something that's sparking things that people already have in their mind. And he opens this account of Jesus, his account of Jesus, with this same play of light and darkness. It's now reworded, it's interpreted to set the stage for God, John's gospel about Jesus. And so he begins in a very similar way. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. Verse 9, the true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of, not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And this is how John opens his story about Jesus. And it's beautiful. It's symbolic. It has poetry. And we can't think that it's any less true just because he doesn't avoid being poetic. This is poetic. This is poetry. This is beauty. So he opens with that, and he continues to weave these themes of light and darkness throughout his gospel, explaining who Jesus is and his purpose here. The things that he said, everything is colored through these, through these themes of light and dark. And at the end of chapter 2, he ends the previous story with saying, and no one, and, and Jesus had no need that anyone should testify of, oh, and no, no one needed to testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Then verse 3, chapter 3, it says, there was a man. He knew what was in all men, and there was a man. His, he was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, and this man came to Jesus by night. By night. Listen to the intentionality of his words, the rhyme of his thoughts as they grow further and further with this, with this one man who came to meet Jesus at night. Nicodemus, he comes to Jesus and he says, Teacher, we know that you are a teacher sent from God. We know this. This is something that we know. And it's interesting how Jesus, he knows what is in man, but Nicodemus says, oh, we know what's in you, Jesus. Then Jesus comes at him and he says, unless you're born again, you won't see the kingdom of God. Out of left field, this comment comes from Jesus. And Nicodemus kind of reels back a little bit and he's thinking, what do you, wait, wait, hold on. Uh, how, how can I be born again? This doesn't make sense. Uh, do I enter back into my mother's womb? This is idiotic. Why are you telling me these things? And Jesus says again, only those who are born again in the spirit can see the kingdom of God. Because if you're born of the flesh, you can understand fleshly things. But in order to understand spiritual things, you have to be born of the Spirit. You see the wind, you hear the wind, but you don't know where it came from or where it's going. So it is with those that are born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus, he pauses, he says, how can these things be? How can these things be? And Jesus says, well, aren't you a leader of religion and you don't know these things? While going through this text this week, going through the preparation for this sermon, I was like, Lord Jesus, I am a teacher in Hollywood and I have no idea what I'm talking about. But Jesus here meets a man in the dark who comes to ask for light. And Jesus explains these things to him, these things that go beyond what he is familiar with. He, 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 Nicodemus is a man that, that has it all together. History tells us that he was a very wealthy man, incredibly wealthy, and he was incredibly generous to the temple, to the ministry, to the poor, to everyone. He, he, was, he was the man. He was the, the one that people looked at and said, now that's a good Israelite. 
That's someone who does what's right, always. This is the one that has integrity. This is the one that is a, a shoo-in to, to the temple and to the, to the kingdom of God. This is the one that probably has a throne set up with his name on it someplace in heaven. Like, he, his place is reserved. He has the ticket. He just has to say his name, and the angels will let him right in. But then Jesus says, you have to be born again. You, you've got to restart you have to do something different than you've already been doing. And Nicodemus, this is a shock to him because he's a good man. And then Jesus explains in, in our text today, which is in your bulletin, it's also in John, it, it's from John 3, verse 14. It begins in 3, verse 14. And Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. So must the Son of Man be lifted up. Jesus tells this, this good Jew about it, the own, his own history of the people, that Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. So must the Son of Man also be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Four, and this is that text that everyone knows. It's the text that, the key text is like, recite something. This is the one they recite. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the Son of God. And Jesus then, he lets Nicodemus in on this little secret. This, this fact of reality. He says, and this is the judgment. This is the judgment. The light has come into the world and the people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works be exposed but whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. The light that came from that, that secret interview in the dark, Nicodemus remembered. He remembered, and it stayed in his mind, and he thought about it for a long time afterwards. This is chapter 3. Judgment is an interesting thing. And to borrow from uh, one of my favorite authors, C.S. Lewis, he, he, in, in um, The Weight of Glory, he uses this illustration that caught me off guard. He says that we as humans were like this kid playing in the slum. They're out in the alleyway, in the gutter, and I'm tweaking his illustration, they're playing with a tin can. They're playing with a tin can in the gutter, and someone comes along and says, I'm going to take you to the toy store. Toys are us. I'm going to take you there, and you can buy a truck. You can buy anything you want. I'm going to take you. And the kid says, no, this is my can. And he continues playing in the gutter. And C.S. Lewis, he says, we, like this kid, are far too easily pleased. We're, we're happy with this, with this junk that we have. We're happy with it. We're content with, with what we already have when we've been promised something so much greater. They love the darkness more than they love the light. You, you know, you might say that that he doesn't, this little boy, he doesn't know what the toy store is. So it's not fair that it's not his fault that he doesn't want to go because he doesn't even know what it is. And that, I think, is what the true point is. We've never seen nor have we been to the spiritual world, right? We cannot know anything about it 
while we play with our trash in the gutter. But it takes someone who knows all about it to come and tell us about it, to relate it to us to, as best as possible, which Jesus does a pretty good job for us to begin to glimpse what this other reality might be. It is light in the darkness. He is light in our darkness. And Jesus means to enter into our ignorance and give us this understanding that there's something better and he is this light. And so Jesus does exactly this with us according to scripture. He, he does this with everyone. The one that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. And at some point in our lives, in everybody's life, he, he tells us about this toy store. In fact, he, he takes some to go see it and others still he, to experience it and he brings presents back from it. The illustration begins to break down right about now. But the text says that the one who gives light to everyone was coming into the world and yet his own did not receive him. And this is the judgment that the light came into the world and the people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. So it is their evil works, it is because of their evil works that they reject the light and love the darkness. They clung to that tin can in, their, in the street and they're like, it's mine, it's mine, it's mine. <laughs> it's more Tolkien and that's another sermon. But judgment, they love the darkness rather than the light. You know, that's the funny thing about judgment. I cannot enter into that process with you. I cannot enter into judgment for you. It's your interaction. It's an interaction that must take place between you and with God. It, judgment is a, is a very personal, very personalized activity. Only you can know what you, have, what you love more. And in the same turn, only you can review and revise the choices that you make to step, either step into the light or back into the darkness. What does darkness look like? I'm not too sure. You can't see darkness, which I suppose is the point. But you can't see light either. Did you realize that? You can't see light, but you can see by light. You can see where you're walking by light, and you can see the things around you by light. You can even see yourself by light. You, by light, you can see the reality that you are truly in, and I think that's why many prefer to stay in the darkness because they see the evil that's in their lives and they don't want to face that. But you and I, we're different. We, we, when we see the evil deeds in the world and then when we turn and see them on our, in ourselves, we react differently. We don't want these evil things to continue to exist, so we step out into the light and ask for, the, for this light because we want these evil deeds to be destroyed, and they can only be destroyed if they are seen, if we can see the things in us to acknowledge them. Did Nicodemus want the light or the darkness? He held on to these thoughts for the rest of the time that Jesus was with them. And when Jesus died, Nicodemus and some other people, they brought, they brought um, ointment for his body, but he was already dead. Nicodemus never got to tell Jesus before he died that his heart had changed that something had happened. And history records that Nicodemus later, he gave all of his money to the work of the early church. 
that everything he had, his great wealth, his influence, everything was completely out and open for, for the church, for the cause of Christ. C.S. Lewis, I mentioned him before, um, his, his personal life truth is added to this one. He was at dinner with some friends, and at that point he was a, he was a complete agnostic, uh, you know, skeptical deist at best, you know. And he was with dinner with friends, at dinner with friends, and he was with... Um, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien was one of them. Uh, they, were, they were all sitting around dinner and, and talking about all sorts of things, as, as professors do. And they, they got up from the table and they went for a walk. And this walk, it, it began to shift to mythology. And he expressed how he, he felt that, even though that there was a lot of um, beauty in mythology, that in the end... They were all just lies. But Tolkien, he, he said, he countered that thought, and he said, instead, the beauty in Christianity is that the myth, this myth, happens to be true. That the universal, this hunger that everybody, every culture, every, every, everybody has for this, for this great epic story was seeded by God, and it's evidence that, that somewhere deep there is, this, there is this mythology that was actually manifested in time and space. And in Jesus Christ, God really did walk this earth and die and rise again. But Lewis was not convinced. He wouldn't have it. Yeah, that's nice. And the walk ended really early in the morning. Uh, sometime later, C.S. Lewis, he, he got into a sidecar on his friend's motorcycle, and they were driving to the zoo, of all places. <laughs> and he's sitting in that sidecar, and this is what he says. When we set out, I did not believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He was thinking about all these things that his friend had been saying to him. When we had set out, I did not believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And when we reached the zoo, I did. The wind blows, and you don't know where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. He just did. Now, I try as a pastor to be a very good pastor. I try. And to be a good preacher, you must always end with an appeal. You, I, I want to make sure that, that you have been given an opportunity to respond. I want you to be able to have heard and thought through this message and at the end of each message have a moment where you can, you can act on not just be a a passive receiver, but to internally or externally act on what you've just experienced. But I look at the, the master preacher here, Jesus, and he doesn't end with an appeal. The story just ends. And I think, why would he do that? So I can only take the same cue that Jesus gave with Nicodemus. He simply ended by saying, but those who do what is true come into the light so as to not hide in darkness anymore. May God bless you all.